Well, here we are again, and today I want to show you how to create a simple four-shot Milky Way panorama. One of my favorite sayings is that I like to turn complicated photography concepts into simple, practical, and easy to follow steps. So let's get into it. Milky Way panoramas are very captivating and are often so impressive that people get the impression that they are very complicated and difficult to produce. Well, like most things, it all comes down to breaking down the picture into the basic steps required to create the image. As I often say about nightscape photography, planning is the key. You have to put in the legwork to get the results. It's as simple as that. Also, we need to think about what we want as an end result before we actually take the image, sometimes well before it even gets dark. This is one of the major differences between daytime landscape photography and nightscape photography. Before we get any further, I'm sure some of you are wondering why we'd even bother with panoramas at all for nightscapes. Surely a good wide angle lens is all I need to capture the Milky Way. Let me answer it like this. Yes, of course, you can shoot a single wide angle shot and get wonderful results. The advantage of shooting a multi-shot panorama, especially with a little bit longer focal length lens, is you can gain a lot more detail in the shot not to mention the ability to capture a greater amount of sky in the final image. As well as that, if you want to print your images, you'll have enormous resolution when working with stitched panorama shots. One of the other benefits of stitching multiple images is that the noise is slightly reduced due to the layering or stacking during the stitching process. So of course we need to work out the usual camera settings for shooting the night sky, as well as making sure we get our composition and focus right. These things are common to all of our night photography exploits. There are lots of techniques and ideas around the process of actually taking panorama images. Some will advocate the use of special panorama tripod heads which display various angles and scales, while others use a simple uncomplicated approach with a standard tripod and ball head. I'll be showing you the simple uncomplicated approach using this tripod and camera set up here. Now the way I take panoramas is very simple and I want to show you using my Nikon D750 with this Sigma 35mm art series lens. Firstly, today's example is going to be a four shot vertical panorama and what I'm going to be doing is shooting uh, with the lens in a horizontal landscape orientation. Now it's really simple and the way I do it is this. Um, the tripod was very low, probably only about uh, 600 millimeters from the ground um, and for the first shot I just leveled up the horizon and made sure that the tree in the foreground was well just off to the right hand side of fraction because I could see when I was looking up into the sky the Milky Way was actually uh, off to the left hand side of the tree so I knew when I was going to take these images and stitch them together, I'd have to lift the camera up to get the top of the Milky Way in the shot. I wanted to make sure the Milky Way was more on the left hand side. Now remember, this is only a simple four shot panorama. So I had the camera in landscape orientation and this is the way I do it. Generally speaking, I'll have my remote trigger. Um, I'll set my first shot up and uh, I'll click the remote trigger, take the shot. Then I've got a ball head here, I'll simply lift the camera up and I do an overlap of around about 50%. That's more than most people do, but I like to just keep it simple. Once again, I'll line up the artificial horizon on the camera, click, and I'll do this as quickly as possible, take the next shot. One more, a low overlap about at least 50%. Artificial horizon, make sure it's level, click. And the last one, the fourth shot, up about that angle there artificial horizon, click, and there's my four images ready to go. So today I'd like to show you this beautiful image which was captured using this very technique with this actual camera equipment. I used the Nikon D750 with the Sigma Art 35mm f1.4 lens. I find this to be a great combination for panoramas as the 35mm focal length has the effect of bringing the background Milky Way closer to the foreground. This is known as focal length compression. You can pretty much use any lens when shooting panoramas, but I find the medium focal lengths between about 20 millimeters and 50 millimeters to be the most suitable. If you shoot with an ultra wide angle lens, let's say about 14 millimeters, then you'll get a lot of distortion around the edges of the frame. Now, before you say, 
oh well, when you stitch the images together, it loses some of the sides anyway because of the overlap. Yes, of course you're right. But from my experience, the images stitch together better with less distortion, especially in foregrounds. Now remember I said this is a very simple method of taking panoramas, and it is only four shots. One of the things that's really critical when shooting panoramas is to keep the time frame as low as possible between the first and the last shot. So if you're shooting uh, a lot more shots than four, say you're shooting 10, 15, or 20, or 30, or whatever, you have to do it very, very quickly. So I've established this method of getting that artificial horizon line. It's just a one button press on the camera and using a ball head, it's really, really easy to do that. Just go, going from side to side and up and down to get it level. And if I can get that done in the very short space of time, the stars haven't moved so far and it makes the stitching process a lot easier. Okay, so talking about stitching, let's get these images into Lightroom and see what we can do with them. Okay, here we are in Lightroom. And you can see down the bottom here, we have our four images, which were taken very quickly, one after the other. When you look at these images, you will see immediately how much overlap there is. That's the first one, second one, third one, and the last one. Lots of overlap. So the um, stitching software has plenty to, to see and recognize between each of the shots. Now I'll quickly just show you, I've done some edits on these and you can see over here in the develop tab up here on the Lightroom on the right hand side, I've bumped up the exposure, the contrast, I've dropped the highlights, added some whites and if I go down, nothing else, not even noise reduction at this point in time. Uh, the other thing I have done is lens profile corrections as you can see here. And if I look at the before and after, uh, really the only thing I've done here, the before is on the left hand side and that's the e slightly edited image on the right hand side. All I've really done is, is boosted the exposure a little bit um, and that's something I'll often do with my pictures um, just because um, I sometimes capture them a little bit underexposed. This is at ISO 2500, 35 millimetre, f2.2 aperture at a 10 second exposure. I could have probably captured this at a higher ISO, maybe 3200 or 6400 ISO uh, to get a brighter image in camera, but I'm uh, with the Nikon D750 and a lot of the Nikon, especially Sony sensors, you can underexpose them without losing anything in the shadow detail. Anyway, so what I'm going to do now is highlight these four images. So I'm just going to hold down the shift button and click on those four images there. And I'm going to right click on anywhere in that and uh, go up to this tab here that says photo merge and go over to panorama. I'm going to click panorama. You can see the projection here is on spherical. There are three options there, spherical, cylindrical and perspective. So it's going through now pr providing a preview. And if I'm happy with that preview, and there it is, it looks a little bit out of whack. So let's just bring that boundary warp across and see what that does. No, don't like that. So I'm just going to go back and I'm going to press cylindrical. Let's see what that does. Sometimes you have to play around with these projection modules here and just to see which one you like the best. And I'll try perspective and see what that does. Okay, so in this case it looks like perspective has been the best option. Sometimes you just got to play with those and see what happens. Now, one thing you can do here is you can press auto crop and that will actually crop the image for you um, or I can uncrop that and I can actually play with this boundary warp slider here and you can see how that sort of creates a little bit of a straighter image without me doing too much at all really. Okay, so I'll just put it back to where it was and I'll press, I, look, I like to look at that image because I can crop it to where I want it to be later. So I'm just gonna leave it there and I'm gonna press merge down here. And now the software is looking at those four images and it's doing the job. And you can see up here, it says creating panorama on the top left and it's going through at a reasonably rapid rate. You just have to wait for that to happen. Okay, so here we go. We can see that that has now finished and it's um, merge that together as the four images into a panorama. From here, I want to do a little bit of work. The first thing I'm going to do is look at the crop. So I'm going into the crop tool here 
and just dragging in the edges. And I can bring that into wherever I want. I really don't want to lose too much of the Milky Way on this left-hand side. So I'm going to leave that fairly wide there and probably just bring in this edge a little bit further over on that side. Um, with panoramas, you can create whatever aspect ratio you want. Uh, and in this case, I'm just going to pull that in a little bit there. Um, and it, this can be adjusted at any stage, so that's not a problem. Okay, I just press uh, done down here on that, and that's, that's cropped it. Now, the other thing I want to do is bring out uh, a bit more color in this yellow before I do anything else. So what, there's a few ways of doing this, but one of the ways I'm going to do this is to use the uh, graduated filter, drag it up from the bottom, just on this bottom part there like so, just on the angle. And I'm going to boost the, um, the exposure here and make it warmer, much warmer, the temperature. Notice how that uh, horizon glow has become much more orange. And I really like that because when I was there, uh, this was facing toward the, um, the direction of that glow is, is, a, is a town that's oh, probably about 20 kilometers away, but it, it creates a beautiful silhouette on that tree, which is what I was looking for. So I've got that graduated filter, which rolls off gently and just gradu uh, gradually gradients away. Love that. So I'm just gonna leave that one there. The other thing I'm gonna do is put another one down from the top on the sky. Now have a look at this. What I'm doing here is I'm going to make some adjustments here. Increase the brightness a bit. That's uh, about, about 80-ish. It's a bit hard to be exact there. Okay, around about there. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing I'm going to do here is add a little bit of dehaze, which brings out a lot of detail up the top there. And then Look at this little color picker here, which is hidden away in the graduated filter tool. I'm going to click on that and actually add a little bit of color to that sky. Now, there's a, a lot of things people uh, do to change the color and the white balance and all sorts of things. But this is, this is something that's hidden away in, in this graduated filter. And you can actually change the sky um, quite dramatically just by clicking on that. And if I want to... Uh, look at it a little bit later and say, well, I want a bit more of that. I can just go back um, and change it to my heart's content. So I'm going to put some more dehaze into that and just see how, that, see how that's bringing the, the tone of it down a little bit. And I actually quite like that. I think that looks pretty good. All right. Now, it's still, I'm not doing a whole lot to this image. Um, I've just, got, I've just noticed I've missed a little bit of that cropping at the top there, so I'm just going to drag that down to get rid of that. Lightroom's great for cropping images. I think it's, it's got really, really good cropping tools, easy to use, um, non-destructive. You can go back and change the crop if you want to, so I really like that. Now, this is, at this point in time, the, the merged image. If you look at the before and after, you can see that I've done a fair bit of work with the colour and the brightness. Um, but, you know... I'm just going to have a look at this again, and I think what I'm going to do here is send this over to Photoshop because I want to do a couple of things just with the with the um, curves in Photoshop. So I'm going to right click on the image, edit in up here, edit in Photoshop, click on that, and what that's doing now is opening up Photoshop, which uh, takes a little bit of time. So let's just wait and see how that goes. So you can see it's reading the camera raw format there. And that's because it's a, a panorama, there's a lot of raw data there, quite a lot. So here we are, we're now in Photoshop. Now, what I'm going to do here is just create a, um, a duplicate layer, which I just did there. By, there's a number of ways of doing that, but I'll do it that way. Click on there, and now I'm gonna add a curves adjustment layer. The curves adjustment layer is either here, you can see all the adjustments here, or you can go down here to this little round circle down the bottom which has all the different uh, adjustment layers you can put on. We're going to put curves. And what that does is gives me this little graph here. You can see sticking out on the side there. And I'm just going to create what's known as an S-curve by dragging the line, this line here, up there and down there. It's created this very slight S-curve. Now you can see if I turn that off, what it's done. See how it's created a whole lot more drama and contrast to the image, which I really like. It's brought out that Milky Way core to be a little bit stronger, and it's actually given that 
tree down the bottom here even more of a silhouette. So, um, and and that's again non-destructive. I can change it a little bit if I if I think it's too much, um, and turn it on and off and just cycle between the two the two versions. Now I love it. I think that looks fantastic. And you know, for this image, that's all I'm going to do. Now, before I leave this image, I'm going to flatten it. So I'm going up to here, layer, flatten image. It's going to say discard hidden layers because there's one there that's not checked. I'm going to click OK on that. And that's going to flatten that down into one layer. The reason I've done that is to save on hard drive space. If you think you want to go back and re-edit this image in Photoshop again, then you wouldn't flatten the image. You just save it as a layered file. Now I'm just going to close down the program. So all I've done there is add curves. I've done nothing else to the image. It's going to ask me if I want to save it. And I say yes. Now what's going to happen? You can see it's saved it back to uh, Lightroom. And there it is. It's brought it back into Lightroom here as a TIFF file. So when I click on that file, that's a TIFF. I'll click F for full screen. And you can see there's our completed panorama. Four shots, 35mm Sigma art lens, shot at F2.2, 10 second exposures on each. And it looks pretty good. Uh, the, the shot that was the... Yeah, there it is there before I sent it off to Photoshop. And that's the after when I brought it back. So it's just got a little bit more tone and contrast, which I love. Now, once this image is back into Lightroom, I can go back to my crop tool. If I, if I want to change the crop, for example, I might want to fit it into a particular frame size, then I can just bring it in like so. And I click on that and love it. From there, I can uh, click the export folder and export it as a JPEG for printing or whatever I want to do with it from there. So in a very short space of time from these original four images, which you can see again down the bottom here, one, two, three, and there's the last one, four, I've merged them together to create this beautiful vertical panorama, even though the shots were all taken in, in um, landscape orientation, which makes it a lot easier to shoot. And that's quite a large file size because it's uh, made up of all of the images from the four. And that's why it's, such, it's got such a dense detail. When you, when you look through the image, it's just got a lot of detail in there. And it's very sharp, very sharp indeed. You can see when you look right down into this tree here, it just looks, fan Oops, it just looks fantastic. And uh, yep. Love panoramas, and this is a simple four-shot panorama. I've done plenty of two-shot panoramas, three-shot panoramas. They don't have to be 20 shots. They don't have to be 30 shots to look absolutely amazing. I could have shot this with a wider angle lens, but I wouldn't have got anywhere near the amount of detail in this shot that I've got with these, shooting it with these four um, images as demonstrated here. So I hope that gives you some incentive to get out under the stars and try out a Milky Way panorama. Once again, I thank you for joining me. I certainly appreciate that you do. Anyway, I'll be back soon with some more interesting Nightscape Images content, and I'll look forward to seeing you then.